Our scripture this morning is uh, from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians uh, in chapter 5, and it's the call to reconciliation. <clears throat> from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we were once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to God's self through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. In 1986, at the General Council in Sudbury, Ontario, the United Church of Canada issued an apology for cultural appropriation and other things. And some of us were here when moderator Bob Smith had delivered that first apology. It was one of the most, I think, electric and electrifying moments in the history of the United Church of Canada. And every time I read this, it brings tears to my eyes as I remember that moment, but also as I remember our call now to reconciliation. Long before my people journeyed to this land, your people were here. And you received from your elders an understanding of creation and of the mystery that surrounds us all that was deep and rich and to be treasured. We did not hear you when you shared your vision. In our zeal to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ, we were closed to the value of your spirituality. We confused Western ways and culture with the depth and breadth and length and height of the gospel of Christ. We imposed our civilization as a condition of accepting the gospel. We tried to make you be like us, and in so doing, we helped to destroy the vision that made you what you were. As a result, you and we are poorer, and the image of the creator in us is twisted, blurred, and we are not what we are meant by God to be. We ask you to forgive us and to walk together with us in the spirit of Christ so that our peoples may be blessed and God's creation healed. And then in 1998, I was honored when I was a moderator of the United Church of Canada to deliver this apology, I'm only going to read part of it, uh, to the survivors of residential schools, their families, and their communities. And again, I am always deeply moved when I recall these words and say them again, starting in the middle of this apology. On behalf of the United Church of Canada, I apologize for the pain and suffering that our church's involvement in the Indian residential school system has caused. We are aware of some of the damage that this cruel and ill-conceived system of assimilation has perpetuated on Canada's First Nations peoples. For this, we are truly and most humbly sorry. To those individuals who were physically, sexually, and mentally abused as students of the Indian residential schools in which the United Church of Canada was involved, I offer you our most sincere apology. You did nothing wrong 
you were and are the victims of evil acts that cannot under any circumstances be justified or excused. We know that many within our church will still not understand why each of us must bear the scar, the blame for this horrendous period in Canadian history. But the truth is, we are the bearers of many blessings from our ancestors, and therefore we must also bear their burdens. I invite Cheryl. Friends of Hillhurst United Church, we are about to experience together what is known as the blanket exercise. There is a diverse community that seeks justice in our country of a partnership of churches and not-for-profit groups. They call themselves Kairos. And several years ago, um, several of those leaders came together to write a story to remind us of our own Canadian heritage. These blankets are about to make their way forward to be laid out on our chancel in order to represent Turtle Island, this land, our home. The Spirit of God, like a soft blanket, you sustain and comfort your people and all parts of creation. These blankets represent the land of the northern part of Turtle Island, what we know as Canada. Long before the arrival of Europeans, this land, represented by the blankets, is home to millions of diverse peoples in hundreds of nations. Their identities were formed by their relationships to the land. All of their needs were met by the land. Food, clothing, shelter, culture, spirituality. In response to this gracious gift from Creator, they protected the land as Creator protected them and folded in the safety of Creator's great blanket. Let us pray. God of life, open our minds and hearts, all of ourselves, to the experiences and realities of indigenous peoples. Give us imagination and compassion, spirits that are open to challenge and to new information. Like Moses at the burning bush, call us to take off our shoes, to connect our bodies to this history, to walk gently and compassionately, to acknowledge that this land is holy ground. Reconciliation is holy work, and holy work can be unsettling with emotions, anger, tears, silence, and confusion may emerge. God of grace, walk with us now to accept ourselves as we are, to acknowledge the past for what it was, and to create a future of respect and reconciliation. So let's begin. A long time ago, come with me and bring your imagination. The blankets spread out here represent the northern part of Turtle Island. 
or what we know as Canada, before the arrival of the Europeans. I invite you to picture yourself on Turtle Island as one of the Indigenous peoples. Place yourself on this land, on these blankets, and imagine your life. Long before the arrival of Europeans, Turtle Island was home to millions of people who lived in thousands of distinct societies that formed hundreds of nations and communities. These nations had their own laws and ways of governing themselves. As nations, you worked with one another. You resolved conflicts over land and resources through treaty making. You were diverse, yet as Indigenous peoples, you shared things in common. Your relationship to the land defined who you were as peoples. Things were happening in Europe at the end of the 15th century that would mean a huge change for you. European explorers had just quote unquote discovered you and your lands. This started a fierce competition between European nations. Scroll A, please. Without even consulting us, you made deals amongst yourselves and divided up control over us and our lands. Usually, whichever nation discovered our land first took control with the blessing of the Christian church. This practice is now called the doctrine of discovery. And so began the process of the European discovery and colonization of Turtle Island. When Europeans first arrived on Turtle Island, they were greatly outnumbered by you, the indigenous people, and they depended on you for their survival. Your relationships with the early settlers were based on cooperation. The settlers and their governors recognized you as distinct peoples with self-governing societies. This led to nation-to-nation -nation relationships which were expressed in treaties, including both trade arrangements and military alliances. Scroll B, please. In the Royal Proclamation of 1763, King George III said indigenous nations own their, their lands. The king said that the only legal way newcomers could gain control of our lands was by making treaties between the two nations. The year 2013 marked the 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation. Later on, the Canadian federal government replaced the crown as a treaty making body and the Royal Proclamation of 1763 was written into Canada's Constitution Act in 1982. To Indigenous peoples, treaties, treaties were sacred agreements that were marked with spiritual ceremonies. They are not statements of surrender or real estate deals. But the Europeans had altogether different views of the land and treaties. For, the land, for them, land was a commodity, an object that they could bought and sold. Treaties were a way of getting you, the indigenous people, to surrender or extinguish your title to the land. Over time, your relationship with, ship with the settlers grew worse. With the end of the War of 1812, the newcomers in the East no longer needed you as military allies. In the West, the fur trade dried up and settlers turned more and more to agriculture as they no longer needed you as trading partners either. Soon, the Europeans began to outnumber you. One reason for this was the diseases the Europeans brought with them. Diseases such as smallpox, measles, tuberculosis, for which you had no immunity. Some experts fully believe that half of the indigenous peoples alive at the time died from these diseases. Some communities lost up to 90% of their members. I extinguish this candle to represent the thousands of first peoples who died from TB, measles, or smallpox. You leave this land, you've died. 
more Europeans also meant an ever-increasing demand for land for settlement. The colonial governments adopted policies to take your land. Some was taken in war. A lot more, since it was taken without any right or justification, was stolen by the government. The Bayotak were the original inhabitants of what is now Newfoundland. If you didn't starve or die in violent encounters with settlers trying to take your lands, you were hunted and killed or taken captive for reward. I extinguish this candle to represent the Bayotak, whose language and culture are now extinct. You take your leave. in the high Arctic. Some of you in Inuit and Inuit communities were removed from your land, your traditional territories, and relocated to isolated, unfamiliar, and barren lands. I extinguish this candle to represent those who died of malnutrition after being forced off their traditional territory, away from their hunting ground. You, leave this land, you have died of malnutrition. In the West, construction of the railway opened up the prairies to settlers. Land was needed for farming, and the government of Canada bought a huge piece of land from the Hudson's Bay Company. This was very hard for some of you who were already living there, such as the Métis and you fought for your land during several different resistances. You won some of these battles, but in the end, you were defeated by the government's soldiers. I extinguish this candle to represent Métis leaders who died in battles, were put in jail, or were executed, leaving your people to flee for their lives. You, Métis leader, leave this land. Scroll C, please. Terra nullius. The notion of terra nullius, which in Latin means land belonging to no one, gave a colonial nation the right to absorb any territory encountered by explorers. If the, if the land was deemed empty by the settler government, it was considered subject to the doctrine of discovery and could be claimed by the European explorers. Over time, this concept was conveniently expanded to include lands not occupied by civilized peoples or lands not being put to civilized use. Scroll D, please. The British North America Act. The BNA, also known as the Constitution Act of 1867, put Indians and lands reserved for Indians under control of the federal government. Sir John A. Macdonald announced that Canada's goal was to do away with the tribal system and assimilate the Indian people in all respects with the inhabitants of the Dominion. The BNA underscored the government's central position, the priorities of assimilation, enfranchisement, and civilization. Scroll E, please. The Indian Act. All laws respecting Indians were first consolidated into the Indian Act in 1876. The Indian Act completely changed our lives. As long as our cultures were strong, it was difficult for the government to take our lands. So the government used the Indian Act to attack who we were as peoples. Hunting and fishing were now limited, and our spiritual ceremonies, like potlatch, powwow, and sundance, were now against the law. This didn't change until the 1950s. Scroll F, please. According to the Indian Act of 1876 and the British North America Act of 1867, 
We and our territories are now under the direct control of the Canadian federal government. We will be placed on reserves. We may not leave our reserve without a permit. We may not vote. We may not gather to discuss our rights. We may not practice our traditional spirituality or our traditional forms of government. To do any of these things is to face arrest, a trial, and time in prison. This will be the case until the 1950s. Under the policy of enfranchisement, the government would reclassify Indigenous people entering certain professions, such as doctors and lawyers as Canadians, making them ineligible for treaty rights. Since this in included lawyers, it effectively prevented land rights cases from reaching the courts during the first half of the 1900s. Scroll G, please. Residential schools. From the mid-1800s until the 1990s, the federal government took First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children from our homes and communities and put them in boarding schools that were run by the churches. The official partnership between the federal government and the churches ended in the 1970s, but some churches continued to operate schools until the 1990s. As parents, we didn't have a choice about this. Sometimes the police arrived to take away our children. These schools were often very far from our homes, mostly they were not allowed to speak our languages, and they were punished if they did. Often our children didn't have enough food. While some report having positive experiences at the schools, most Indigenous people suffered from the impoverished conditions and many from emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. Raised in an institution, many lost their culture. Most lost their parenting skills. Some did not come home. I extinguish this candle to represent the thousands of children who died at residential schools or who died later as a result of their experience. You. Leave this now. Scroll H, please. 1969 White Paper. This proposed federal legislation suggested abolishing the Indian Act and assimilating Aboriginal peoples into Euro-Canadian society as a solution to the Indian problem. Indigenous peoples saw this legislation as an attempt to terminate their rights. Outraged, they organized to defeat it. From this movement, the National Indian Brotherhood, now the Assembly of First Nations, was born. Scroll H, please. Oh, I just read that, sorry. Scroll I, please. In the modern day, large companies can set up shop on our territories, generate huge profits from natural resources, and often pollute and deplete the land without regard to Aboriginal or treaty rights, and without benefits flowing to Indigenous peoples. Many Indigenous peoples continue to view treaties as sacred agreements between sovereign nations that must be honoured to ensure equitable sharing of resources and a peaceful, just coexistence. But that view, similar to biblical notions of covenant, continues to go largely unrecognised by non-Indigenous society, which views treaties primarily as surrenders, as surrender documents. One way the Canadian government pressures you, the Indigenous peoples, to leave your lands and assimilate is by failing to provide enough funds for basic services. There are 85,000 new housing units needed on reserve, and 60% of existing homes are in need of repair. 
Many communities have inadequate access to health care. This contributes to such situations as the rates of TB among the Inuit that are 185 times higher than for Canadian board non-Indigenous people. Over half the water systems on reserve pose a significant risk to human health. Scroll J, please. UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The declaration was a response by the United Nations to the lack of international standards on the rights of Indigenous peoples. Although Canada had played an important role in developing the declaration, it was one of only four countries to vote against it at the United Nations in 2007. The Government of Canada finally endorsed the declaration on November 12, 2010, but as an aspirational document. Nevertheless, the endorsement was welcomed by most Indigenous groups and their allies who see it as an important first step towards a new relationship that upholds their human rights. In 2015, the federal government committed to implementing the declaration. We unfold the blanket to symbolize the reclaiming of some Indigenous rights. Scroll K, please. The calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. Thanks to the courage of the residential school survivors, in 2008, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created out of a settlement agreement. Commissioners heard approximately 7,000 testimonies and issued a summary report and 94 calls to action in 2015. As the commission completed its work, Justice Murray Sinclair, the chief commissioner, stated, we have described for you a mountain. We have shown you the path to the top. We call upon you to do the climbing. Another blanket is unfolded as a symbol of resurgence of indigenization in Canada. I invite you to turn your mind back to what the blankets looked like when we began the reflection and compare that to what they look like now. Today, we stand at a crossroads. Behind us is colonialization, broken promises, disrespected treaties, disease, terror, death, but also indigenous resistance, resilience, culture retained, the apologies of the churches who ran the schools, the apology of the federal government, repudiations of the doctrine of discovery and the endorsement of the UN Declaration. In front of us lies the implementation of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The opportunity to decolonize our minds and our hearts, to renew relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. The opportunity for not only truth and reconciliation, but justice and human rights, cultures, spiritualities, and languages remembered, and the opportunity to work together to bring real, lasting change to the current inequities facing Indigenous peoples. To make this change, we need a sense that this story is about all of us, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, original inhabitant, early immigrant, recent immigrant, it is about the integrity and equality of all. We are all treaty people. We need to bring the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its findings and calls to action into the newspapers, schools, churches, boardrooms, city councils, kitchens, into non-Indigenous Canadians' lives daily. We need to bring the UN Declaration into law and policy and practice, into meaningful implementation. We need to know that each of the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we need to make them a reality. We need to remember and renew peace and friendship treaties.
and we all need to be changed. In the spirit of reconciliation and healing, I will share the Cree healing song. During the third round, I will stop drumming but continue to sing. I invite you to close your eyes and focus on your personal healing, on the healing of those close to you, on the healing message that we are sharing this day to take responsibility for your own healing. This is the Cree healing song, also known as a crying song or the wailing song. Ah hey, ah hey, ah hey, ah ho. Way high, way high, way high, yo. Way high, way high, way high, yo. Way high, way high, yo. Ah hey. Thank you, Mother Earth, for the gifts of your bounty. Thank you for the teachings of the four directions and our elders, beloved creator. Thank you for this gift of life, for the gift of love. Beloved creator, let thy will be done.